All right, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the cardiovascular keynote session. And uh, I'm Paul Isio, a professor here at the U. I've uh, been help organizing this session for years, um, getting you know keynotes. And then you invite people. You always shoot for the stars. Um, and this time, the stars align, because I got two amazing keynotes on the first try. Uh, Dr. Todd Britton and Dr. Billy Cohn, and I'm not going to introduce them because these guys really don't need a lot of introduction. They're at the top of the field in innovation. Uh, I think they'll be telling us about their work, um, so I'm not going to eat up their question and answer time. So with that, Billy, uh, thanks, Paul. Take it over. It worked out great. Uh, my little sister lives here in Minneapolis, and yesterday was her birthday, and my mom lives here too, so thank you for having the, the rescheduling the meeting to accommodate us. <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm a heart surgeon. I've been a heart surgeon my whole life. Uh, six years ago, I went to the dark side, worked for Johnson & Johnson now, developing medical devices, uh, but I'm still clinically active, and I'm going to tell you about a project that's outside of Johnson & Johnson, and if I convey nothing else to you, uh, uh, hopefully you'll realize how rapidly the technology is changing and how much passion I have for this uh, work that I'm doing. The work that I'm describing represents the work of tons of really, really smart people, but I get to come here and talk about it, and that's a real honor. Um, I should say, before I start, though, that this is work that I'm doing that Johnson & Johnson has graciously allowed me to do in addition to my job at J&J. &J. And I don't want you to take any of what I say to suggest that Johnson Johnson has an investment, emotional, financial, or otherwise, in this work. Most of this work is a separate group that I'm very privileged to work with. Uh, with that in mind, I'm gonna talk a lot about blood pumps and how the design of blood pumps has changed over the last 10 or 15 years and how that's been led by uh, advances in computational fluid dynamics, computer-aided design, and 3D printing. Any of you know anything about this field? These are pumps that are implanted in a patient with end-stage heart failure that keep them from dying. And it takes the blood out of your weak heart, pumps it through your body. Initially, the pumps were big, pulsatile devices with flexible membranes, but around the 2000 era, we switched to rapidly spinning turbine-powered pumps, and these pumps are increasingly becoming part of the mainstay of therapy for end-stage heart failure. Interestingly, this is really the only pump, these two actually, the only pumps on this slide that are still being used clinically. All these have been developed and have had their moments in the sun, but are all gone now. But I'm going to show these just to illustrate some of the challenges with pump design. This is the HeartMate 2. This was the most popular pump for a number of years and tens of thousands of them were implanted and there are patients right now still walking around with these pumps that are 15, 16, 17 years out. It has a single moving part, this is called the impeller, that spins kind of like a jet, seat, uh, jet ski propeller would. It's supported by two bearings. This uh, is an inducer that gets the flow lined up for the spinning element and then this is a flow straightener that takes that rapidly rotating blood and the pressure generated from that rotation and turns it into forward flow. As you can imagine, every detail of this, the angles, the radius of curvature, uh, the diameters, has to be very carefully designed. This is another obsolete pump, and I should say, that pump is no longer with us because it was replaced by better technology, but shows what an axial flow pump is. Axial because the flow is along the axis of the rotor. Now, a much more common pump, including uh, the, the uh, category leader, HeartMate 3, the Abbott HeartMate 3, use centrifugal mechanism, meaning there's a spinning rotor here, a spinning impeller. Blood comes in through this tube, hits the impeller, gets in these grooves, and gets thrown out here. Um, these two parts clamshell together. And very interestingly, this is called the volute the area that the impeller spins in. And you can see it's not axisymmetric. It's a close spacing. It gets wider here, then narrower again. And there's this one thing called the cut water, this little uh, uh, barrier. Some of the blood goes around for another lap. Some of it goes here. Getting the radius of curvature, figuring out 
the geometry of this non-round shape takes a lot of work. And we've got those tools now, but it's amazing this field ever started because uh, in its infancy, you had to get all these things right. All the little changes in geometry, radiuses of curvature, how many veins, how deep they were. I mean, look at this. Why four? Why not five? Why not six? How deep? How to get these hydrodynamic bearings right? A lot of math, a lot of science, and any little tweaks in any of those change how the pump performs. Whether it breaks up blood, you know, a red cell can only have a certain amount of shear, be exposed to a certain amount of shear before it lyses. If you're just below that level, well, you can tolerate it, but only for a certain duration. And so making sure the same red cell doesn't stay in the pump too long, making sure it doesn't get exposed to too much shear, making sure there's not flow separation in areas where blood's not moving, causing clot, getting the right pump performance, energy efficiency. It's amazing the field ever got started because the tools to do this didn't always exist. This is Captain Hemo. This is Rich Wampler, arguably the father of rapidly spinning pumps. Uh, he was a general surgeon who got frustrated halfway through residency and quit, worked in ERs, but decided he wanted to develop a blood pump. Uh, he did missionary trips to Egypt, and while there, he saw two Egyptian workers using a sawed-off, which is a, basically an Archimedes screw and a tube to pump water up a riverbank. And he reasoned that if you could use something like this to move water against gravity, you could probably use it to move blood against pressure. A very brilliant thought. But again, this was in 1982. In the 1982, he conceived of this device. There were no motors small enough or powerful enough that you could thread them in the human body in 1982. There are now, but he put the motor outside the body on the patient's leg and had a spinning cable that went through a tube to the little rotor, the impeller in the back of this tube, and reasoned that if he could thread this whole thing up the femoral artery, put this tube across the aortic valve, spin a little impeller right here fast enough, he could pull a meaningful amount of blood out of the heart and at least for a couple days keep the patient from dying uh, from cardiogenic shock. But how to make this little rotor to sit back there? Well, he did what many brilliant engineers do. He went to the library and got the classic textbook. This is Stepanoff. This book has been around forever and ever and is the mainstay of how to design turbines, propellers, things like that. Did it have a section on how to design an impeller to pump blood? No. No one had ever put a rapidly spinning anything inside the body, certainly not in the blood system. But it showed how to pump gas and oil and other fluids and how to make wind turbines and hydroelectric uh, pumps. And so he went in, figured out what he needed to learn. Brilliant, brilliant guy. Uh, had no engineering background. Started taking classes at UC Berkeley to get up to speed. But he, uh, with paper and pencil and a slide rule, figured out the design of his rotors. He figured out how much, uh, it was well known how much shear a red cell could be exposed to. He knew how big around the device could be and still be able to thread it up the femoral artery. So with that, he figured out how fast it would have to spin, how the rotors would have to be designed, how he was going to make this, and then had to prototype it. Well, he's not a machinist either. But he's a very clever and resourceful guy. And what a lot of people do when they prototype, and for the engineers in the room, I think you'll agree, you make just a really big one. Uh, he did it out of mahogany, bondo, and blades from stone axes. And just kept doing this over and over again until he had an impeller that all the angles, all the radiuses uh, represented what he had in his mind and said, if I spin, make this eight millimeters across and spin it at 25,000 RPMs, I should stay below the critical threshold. He then took his completed stone axe and bondo and mahogany prototype to a jeweler who used something called a pentagraph, a little sort of a rector set that allows you to scale down medical devi uh, any device. And the jeweler made his first impeller that he took to my mentor, Bud Frazier, who put it in cow after cow after cow and then did the first human being in the world with a rapidly spinning anything 
1988. Just monumental achievement that I don't think any of us have the courage or conviction or willpower to do in the modern era. Just like there's no pilot alive today that could fly the spirit of St. Louis over the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the world has changed dramatically since 1988, over the last 40 years or so. We now have computational flow dynamics. You can design your impeller, all the features you want. In fact, you can just plug in numbers and it will auto-design it. And you can say, if it's spinning this fast, tell me about shear. This is the impeller from the HeartMate 3, the category leader right now, made by Abbott. That's probably 30 of them are being put in today around the country. This is the volu, the non-axisymmetric uh, uh, area that the uh, impeller spins in. And you can do very, very good calculations and see if your shears about where it needs to be, where the problem areas are going to be, uh, and find solutions. In addition, we said you can be subcritical shear, but if you stay in there too long, you're at peril. This is a, a thing that allows you to look at uh, dwell different particles, how long they stay in the device. And with those two computational flow dynamics and software like uh, Turbo CF, now just about any OK engineer can design a pump. But it turns out, no matter how well it works in silico on your computer, you're going to need to test it. Because when you take those digital assumptions and actually make it and do it on the bench, then on the bench in blood, then in an animal, you always learn tons and go back and, and tweak and redesign. Um, so, taking that uh, into my life, uh, this is SolidWorks. How many of you do SolidWorks? Yeah, every hand went up, even the guy who's serving coffee. SolidWorks is ubiquitous. It's at every engineering school. It's at every undergrad. Now most high schools have it. With this, anybody can design really cool things, but then you still need to go have it machined, and that takes a skilled machinist, uh, we have CNC machining that all you know about, uh, uh, computer numeric control, where you can put that computer aided design in and it'll make it. By the way, Todd, this is my uh, machine shop at the uh, Johnson Johnson CDI. Not bad. Um, the, uh, uh, so it was still super labor intensive until, you know, 2006, 2007, when 3D printing came out. And I was all in. I was doing CAD, but I didn't have a good machinist. Nobody had their own 3D printers then. I used a place called Johnny Quick Parts. I would design a part. I would email it to them. It would show up seven or eight days later in the mail, wrapped in bubble wrap for like $80 a part. But then I remember when we got our first 3D printer. And this is a bit of a dinosaur, the Objet Stratasys uh, 30 Pro. But boy, did this change my life. Because with this, I could design parts and print them that day. And I could put 20 parts on it at once. And I could come in the next day and have my little pieces to iterate with. And it was so fun. And it changed my life and the life of a lot of uh, prototyping would-be uh, wannabe engineers. It was super helpful when Bud Frazier, my mentor, came and said, Hey, Broly. He kind of mumbles. Hey, Broly, let's make a cap of the pump that you put into this clay run artery. He had this idea that we were going to make something that went down the vein across the atrial septum into the left atrium and it'd be a little turbine and all the electronics would be in the wall of the outflow graph but the turbine would sit in the left atrium and the outflow graph would run backwards up the superior vena cava backwards out the subclavian vein exit through a hole and you'd sew it to the subclavian artery so this would be a pump that you could put in without going on the heart lung machine through a two or three inch incision below the collarbone that would pump oxygenated blood from the left atrium into the subclavian artery. It sounds great, and you can make great animations that suggest it's doable, but how to even get started? Well, this is our first ambitious project where we said, ah, oh, 3D printing. Now, I never read Stepanoff, and I don't really know much about impellers, but I've looked at a lot of them, and it seemed to me that I could design something. This is a software that I use, a, a CAD program that's really cheap. We knew it needed one impeller to pump the blood and then one maybe to keep the motor clean. And then some sort of inflow, uh, inlets uh, to let blood in 
and some sort of outflow with straighteners, and we just made all this stuff up. But we didn't have to get it right because we could take so many shots on goals. And we took, made 25 different flow straighteners, 25 different impellers, 25 different housings, and in a week or two, printed them all up and made good assumptions, but no stepping off. We weren't uh, shooting for the goal. We were just trying to see if we could do something meaningful and made this plastic printed pump. And then we got a motor from this guy named Stuart Coford who makes slot car motors. And there's our little pump swimming around in 40% glycerin. Um, this is a flex circuit. This is a little, uh, uh, this conveys the power to the pump. And here you can see it's spraying 40% glycerin. And so many things were wrong about this, but it was close enough that we could sew it in some poor hapless animal. And there it is in the left atrium, pumping blood backwards through the superior vena cava into the carotid artery. With this, we were able to compel two brilliant people to get their PhD on this, Shelby Bioretz and Alex Smith. The science advanced dramatically. We got an NIH grant. Uh, Yashin Wang is now running this program. And now it has legs, but only because of 3D printing. So this really impressed upon me that 3D printing might be the salvation of the wannabe physician innovator. A lot of things have happened since then. First of all, CAD has gotten much easier to use. This runs on a Mac, and it's $75. Uh, there's freeware CAD that's super powerful. So to not do CAD, I mean, uh, you guys are a skewed bunch with a lot of engineers in the room, but at medical meetings, I say, how many of you know how to do CAD? And nobody raises their hand. And I say, how many of you know how to do PowerPoint? Everybody raises their hand. I said, how did you learn to do PowerPoint? Did you take a course? No, they sat down and monkeyed with it. This is even easier. I think everybody needs to learn this stuff because it gives your ideas legs. Now, 3D printers are everywhere. Um, these are nine of the pop, there's 30 different kinds. Uh, the top four, the ones that we have at, uh, at my J&J facility, the Center for Device Innovation. And they're so cheap and so easy to use. These are digital light processing DLP printers where it shines the whole cross section at once so you can print things really, really fast. You can buy them at Home Depot. You can buy them at Best Buy. You can buy them at Micro Center. They're cheap. Everybody needs to have one of these in their garage. This is my workhorse, though. These are the filament printers, the fused deposition modeling. These are Mark IVs. These are sort of higher-end ones, but we can... Uh, um, interlace the plastic with carbon fiber or Kevlar or fiberglass so you can print a crescent wrench that you can tighten rusty bolts with. I mean, it's just amazing. And with those things, you can make anything you want. It's become faster. It's become cheaper. And now you don't need any training. Anybody, anybody can learn to use a 3D printer in an hour. And I know, Paul, you've got like 100 of them in your uh, visible heart lab. Uh, printers printing printers. Um, so... And then batch rendering, being able to make 20 versions of a part instead of an, having an engineer make you one and get it to you in a couple days. Um, now, all that led up to what I'm supposed to be talking about is how this man changed my life. Uh, Bud Frazier and I were cutting out the hearts of animals and replacing them with two LVADs. It was our continuous flow, pulseless, total artificial heart. And the animals would get up and walk on treadmills and we were really excited. And then finally, uh, in a moment of desperation, we had a patient with systemic amyloid who was in cardiogenic shock. He wasn't a transplant candidate. Uh, it was contraindicated for syncardia, the only heart that was uh, available on the market, which is a temporary device. We put our twin turbine device in a human patient. And he extubated and woke up and actually did well for uh, a month and a half. It was amazing, but it really was a shot heard around the world. We gave a TED Talk. On it, we were on the cover of Popular Science, but we got on this guy's radar. This is a brilliant young engineer from uh, Brisbane, Australia, whose father died of heart failure. And he was dedicated to figuring it out. Of course, he couldn't do it in the time that his father had left, but did his PhD in developing what he thought would be the world's first permanent total artificial heart. Why don't we have a total artificial heart? You can make a beating heart. And that's what everybody's done so far with membranes and a mechanism to make them move back and forth and four valves like a heart. 
but they're large. They require a lot of energy. It's hard to get the two sides to balance. What do I mean there? Well, the right side of your heart and the left side of your heart don't pump the same amount. They differ by just a little bit. All the blood that your right heart pumps out goes through your lungs to your left heart. But all the blood that the left heart pumps out doesn't go back to the right heart. A small percentage goes out through the bronchioles and comes back to the left. It's about a cc or two per heartbeat, but if your heart's beating 120,000 times a day, it adds up. And it's been a real challenge to design systems that, uh, that can perform that balance by think, thinking about rotary pumps, rapidly spinning pumps, he was able to get around that, but also the biggest problem was poor durability. All the beating pumps lasted a year, a year and a half. No one's made a beating heart, artificial heart, that lasts more than two years. By going to continuous flow, he thought he could have the solution for that. Now, the device that he envisioned was very complex, and I'll show you what it looks like today. It didn't look like that in 2011 when we met. <coughs> the device has exactly one moving part. It's a magnetically levitated double-sided rotor. This Stonehenge thing takes the venous blood and pumps it to the lungs. This pinwheel takes the bright red blood coming back from the lungs and pumps it to the body. There's a brushless DC motor that makes it spin. And there's three electromagnets that are adjusting 20,000 times a second to keep the rotor levitated. Kind of a complex device, okay? So here's the brushless DC motor. Here are the three electromagnets and three eddy current sensors that are adjusting 20,000 times to keep this thing spinning. So the spinning member isn't touching anything. Well, we have the same challenges that I talked about with LVADs. Any little uh, problem with design can cause hemolysis. Maybe red cells will stay in the pump too long and, and uh, be, become fragile. Uh, if there's any place where blood's not moving, you can get clot, pump performance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we had the added incredible complex uh, uh, challenges that since both impellers are on the same spinning thing, they have to spin at the same speed. And if they're spinning at the same speed for these very two cir different circulations, a pulmonary low resistance, uh, systemic much higher, the changes they go through during exercise, coughing, Valsalva, going to the bathroom, trying to figure all that, big, big challenge. Then also figuring out the leak path and then making it so it could balance. Those were the challenges. How to solve them? Well, I'll get to there in a second. Here's what I mean about balancing. See how big that gap is? That gap can get small or big based on feedback from these electromagnets. What's the difference? The smaller that gap is, this is the left rotor, that, uh, the left impeller, that pinwheel. The closer it gets to this surface, the more efficient that pump gets. It gets to be very ferocious. The further away it gets, the less efficient it gets. And that's uh, exaggerated for this animation. It really only moves seven tenths of a millimeter. By moving that back and forth, and not cyclically like shown here, but by adjusting it, we can control the relative efficiencies of the left and right pumps, which is what your heart naturally does. So if you start coughing, the resistance to flow through your pulmonary circulation goes way up, that left pump better slow down because the right's not going to deliver enough for it and it's going to suck flat. So the rotor has to immediately move to the right. Similarly, when you exercise and your systemic vascular resistance goes up, the rotor has to move to the left. 20,000 times a second, it has to make a decision about that. How to figure that out? How to figure that out? Prohibitively count. Uh, challenging, but not with 3D printing. This device existed as a digital file later in its evolution, and it allowed us to print part after part after part. The volute, again, is the non-axisymmetric, the non-round shape that the impeller spins in. We printed 50 different volutes. We printed tons of different right-sided rotors those are the ones with the Stonehenge little ensemble. Some had four, some had five, some had six, some had eight, some had ten. Wider, narrower, different radius of curvature. These are all left-sided impeller. They look similar, but different numbers of veins, different heights, different radius of curvatures. Some are back swept, some are forward swept. How to figure it all out? Stepanoff says, yeah, all those should work. But how to figure out which ones 
we're going to function correctly at the same RPM and have the right responsiveness as we moved our rotor. Well, we designed this little piece of, of tech. This is a little, it has a motor in it that allows us to spin any impeller in any volute. While spinning it, we can adjust the speed by going up and down on the motor, and we can adjust the resistor. We had a computer-controlled pneumatic resistor that pinched down on the hose, so someone didn't have to sit there doing it. It would run through all of its RPMs and all of its afterloads. At every spacer, we had a vernier micrometer here, so we could advance the rotor a quarter of a millimeter at a time, and generated volumes and volumes of graphs like this. So this is one impeller and one volute combination at a bunch of different speeds and afterloads at different quarter millimeter increments. We did hundreds of these for all the different left rotor combinations, for all the different right rotor combinations, and said, ah, that's our best right rotor, and that's our best left impeller for a human. Then became just a simple jump from there to print the whole thing. Here, these are the three little electromagnets that, that levitate the magnetically levitated uh, impeller that keep it floating so there's no mechanical wear. It's never going to fail. It's, it's like a HeartMate 3. Um, these are eddy current sensors at 20,000 times a second. Look at where the rotor is and uh, inform these magnets whether they need to pull or push the impeller. Here's the brushless DC motor. Look how thin that layer is. It has to be very thin so the brushless DC motor is intimate with the rotor and that's one of the problems with a plastic device. But this gave us a lot of information. Here's our impeller with the best right-sided impeller and best left-sided impeller mounted to two sides of the rotor. This has uh, neodymium iron boron magnets in it, rings that talk with these three and then discrete magnets that talk to this brushless DC motor. And with this, we're allowed to make the entire device and iterate it over and over again. But we're allowed to do, uh, this uh, allowed us to do hemolysis studies and show that it didn't hurt red blood cells at all. It doesn't even activate a, a acquired von Willebrand. And allowed us to put it in a flow loop and simulate exercise, uh, heart failure, hypovolemia, every state, so we could get our algorithms down. And then in uh, a bit of hubris, we sewed this plastic printed heart into an animal. We went on cardiopulmonary bypass, we cut out its heart, and we did this five different times. Here's the plastic printed heart, band ties from Home Depot, of course. Here's the outflow graft end to end to the aorta, the outflow graft end to end to the pulmonary artery. These were early iterations of our cuffs that sew to the back wall of the left atrium. And there's that cow the next day, extubated with no heartbeat, no pulse, no EKG, with a heart that was printed on an Object 30 Pro, which is really a, a, uh, a, a relic. Uh, here you can see this is the rotor position. You can see the rotor is moving every time it breathes. When it inhales, its pulmonary vascular resistance drops. When it exhales, it goes up. Anyway, with this, we said, this is great, but we can only go for three days. Why? Those thin plastic uh, components would soak up water because uh, the, the, the plastic is hygroscopic. It would warp. It had to be exactly flat. But this informed us. It only took us five tries to say, this is the design we're going with. So what do we do next? 3D printing in metal. Selective laser sintering. You've all seen it. You take a metal dust. Each little grain of dust is a perfect sphere, 1 30th of a millimeter in diameter. You lay out a sheet of it. Uh, a laser melts it together using your same computer file you put in the plastic printer. It does this all night long, uh, melting the little metal beads together. And this is, a, a, this is an EOS machine. This technology has advanced dramatically. The next morning, we put on respirators. You brush off the titanium dust, and they're rising like Venus from the mist is the Bivacore titanium heart. We gave it a good polishing. Here it is with a Diet Coke, which is the uh, volumetric standard for measuring uh, circuitry assist pumps. Still kind of crude. You can see we did the best we could to polish it, and it was hard to polish the inside. We pressurized rouge through it. But this allowed us to go and do some chronic animals. 
here we are in the operating room. Shout out to the team. Um, there's Daniel Timms, Nick Graytrix, Matthew uh, Kleinseifer, just brilliant, brilliant engineers making this Nobu. Here's Rich Wampler, Captain Hemo. He used to come for a lot of the implants. And there's me. Um, there's the device in place. We have a huge team at the Texas Heart Institute Cardiovascular Research Lab. I think it's the premier institution of its type. This is uh, Gil Costas, our veterinarian, who works full-time down there. Uh, here's Kelly. She rides with the animals when we come out of the OR. But you couldn't do this kind of work without a team with these capabilities and this conviction and this passion. And it's just uh, fantastic. There's, there's Mateus at the head of the bed. Um, so here's a three-month animal with that printed titanium device in. And with the way this autonomous rotor uh, adjustments work, without us touching any knobs, the cardiac output went from 11 to 14 with just him exercising and eating uh, water out of a syringe, usually molasses. It's really neat. Uh, this was this stanchion, this motorized stanchion that we would exercise the animals in. Very labor intensive to take them out of the stanchions. We have to keep them in a stanchion because they've got drive lines and IVs and things, but we try to be really nice to them and play with them and give them a, a decent life. But it's really challenging getting them out of their stanchion and putting them on this uh, treadmill. So we innovated a stanchion with a motorized floor. This is where the animal lives every day. A couple times we just click it on and the animal starts walking. So they get lots of exercise and uh, this uh, animal went a couple months. Uh, so now, here we are. We think we've developed this thing that's really important. But there's no way we're going to get a 3D printed metal device through the FDA. You can in orthopedics and oral maxillofacial. But again, here comes 3D printing to the rescue. We had to do design for manufacturing which for a device like this is rather complex. But if you get to play with a 3D printer and make the parts and see how they're going to fit together and in what order you're going to put them together and then when you're, when you're going to polish them, when you're going to laser weld and see where the critical dimensions are, it gets really easy. So that's what we did. Working with a DFM organization, Design for Manufacturing organization, we used 3D printing, figured out what we were going to do, and then one by one crafted the parts, actually machined them, and showed that they still fit with the plastic parts. Uh, the, that gold color, by the way, is titanium nitrite, really hard uh, uh, surface finish that a lot of pumps use. Um, and we could make functional units. Really, really exciting to hand this to someone when it was on and levitated and have them ooh and ah over it. Really, really cool. Um, and so here's the functionality. I'm just about done. This thing will pump 23 liters a minute. It'll outpump every heart in this room by a wide margin. I joke, and Bud Frazier groans when I say at the 2,200 Olympics, there's going to be stock and modified. Uh, we can make a very compelling pulse with this by um, cycling fast, slow, fast, slow RPM. We can make an arterial tracing that a cardiologist will look at and say, what's the big deal? not realizing it's an artificial heart. It balances better than any device that's ever been made. There's no mechanical wear. You know, those big pulsatile pumps were great ideas. So were airplanes with flapping wings, but they had no place in the future of the field. We think uh, one moving part, the mechanical s simplicity, the ability to outpump any device. Our cows have lower plasma-free hemoglobin than a normal cow. We didn't make that claim. That's just an observation scientifically. It doesn't activate von Willebrand, uh, and uh, it's got a program left to right shunt over the outside of the rotor so venous clot can never make it into the left side. It's small. It's really, really cool. There's no way it would exist without 3D printing. Uh, in summary, uh, I think 3D printing has certainly changed this world. It's changed a lot of worlds and will continue to, you all need to go buy one and have it in your garage. Um, continuous, blood, uh, continuous flow blood pumps are perfect for this kind of work. You, we can make a pulse if we want. They're smaller, they're more robust. And I'll go out on a limb and say the first practical permanent mechanical replacement for the failing heart will be continuous flow. If it's not this, it's going to be something like this. Um, 
If anybody's interested, I have, after Todd gives his talk, I have a, I brought something for show and tell. If you want to see this, this is a clinical grade device. This is the world's first practical permanent total artificial heart. We will get rid of the drive line and power it inductively. Uh, but uh, it's been the adventure of a lifetime working with all these brilliant people and learning all this stuff. And I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. That was fantastic, Billy. And I'll turn it over. Do we have any questions from, from the audience? So, so two things. Uh, why the left and the right are different? Uh, how, what, what guided you in making the left side and the right side? Great different? question. Why are the left and right impellers so different? Well, first of all, the circulation is so different. The way the pulmonary vascular resistance changes with activity, the way the systemic vascular resistance changes with activity are completely different. The pulmonary vascular resistance is so much lower than the systemic vascular resistance. And what's the big liability of a pump in the right side in circulation? Thrombus, right? We all throw little clots to our lungs all the time and the lungs work like a sieve. And if we don't have a patent foramen ovale or a, parox a paroxysmal uh, embolus, we're okay. And how do we know that? We do uh, autopsies on healthy people that have died. We find little emboli in their lungs. We all make little clots. When you sit down cross-legged or uh, um, and particulate stuff, putting an impeller, a fine, you know, small gap impeller that clot's going to go through may be a challenge. That's why that looks like the paddle wheel on a riverboat. That's why they did it on riverboats. So when they hit bushes and snags in the water, they could keep going. You can bomb this with big thrombus. It'll chop it up and pump it to the lung and go, we're fine, and keep going just like your heart does. So it had to be thrombus friendly. It had to be able to accommodate the completely different pulmonary circulation, the systemic circulation, but at the exact same rota uh, rotational speed. If we made the left and right rotor similar and expose the pulmonary circulation to that right rotor, it would just totally run rampant. We had to make it less efficient, more clot tolerant, and matching the left-right motion and the rot rotary, motion, uh, rotary uh, speed. So there was a lot to it, but great question. Yeah. Oh, wonderful, Billy. Thank you very much for, for that. Um, as uh, the project went on, um, you would have to have more and more funding. Could you share with us uh, where those funding sources came along the way? Yeah, well, at this point, I can blow my nose on a napkin and people will give me money for it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, so we've raised about 40 million bucks, which is very little for how far we've gotten. But uh, Daniel and I would do the road show. We'd go up the west coast and the left, uh, and the left coast, the right coast, People's Republic of Cambridge. Uh, so uh, um, it was just a matter of finding the right people that had the right vision. All the ones that I thought would do it didn't because it's too early. They want us to do first in man. I think if first in man goes as well as some of these cows do, uh, we'll get to pick who's in the syndicate. The last round was led by Cormorant out of Boston. Uh, One Ventures is invested. S3. We, we've got a great syndicate. We've got, had some angels that got us started, but we've got a really great board and great people around the table. We just hired Tom Vazialades, who was with Medtronic Forever and Ever, is now our CEO. So Daniel is now the CTO. And I've got a camera on a, an animal now, if any of you want to see after we finish, uh, of a, the cow that's going right now that I put the device in two and a half weeks ago. Before you leave the stage, what's your quick uh, two-bit advice to young starting engineers on uh, what tools they should put in their toolbox, what kind of training? Yeah. Work with smart, good people. Life is too short to work with jerks. Work with honest people that are hardworking. Be passionate. If your project doesn't elicit passion in you, it's not the right pa project because it takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of perseverance because things never go right. And sometimes you find yourself standing against a brick wall and you just got to figure a way around it. And so uh, part of your job as a team member is being a, a therapist to, to 
keep everybody engaged, a cheerleader to celebrate what goes wrong and to rally support when things don't go, uh, and then uh, just persevere. Work with cool people on cool stuff, though. That's the main one. Thanks, Billy. That was great. Thank you, Paul. All right. We got uh, Todd's slides up. Um, again, needs a little in oh, introduction. Thanks. Chief Scientific oh, Officer now at uh, Edwards Life Sciences, but has been at Stanford Biodesign for years, um, interventional cardiologist, um, uh, entrepreneur, serial innovator, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. So thanks, Todd. Well, thank you. Uh, actually, that, yeah. Well, let me tell you, it sucks following Billy Cohen. <laughs> Talk about a guy who inspires. Uh, that was my goal. Uh, my goal is basically today to inspire you a little bit. Um, you know, I think while we're all here is uh, medical devices. So what, what is it about medical devices that makes things so exciting? And I would say it's, you know, we all put the tech into medicine, right? The med tech field is really about putting technology into medicine, but why do we do it? We ultimately do it for patients, right? I think Billy really set the stage for this, is it? The innovation is really, at the end of the day, we really want to make an impact on people. Um, and you know, much of the field out there of engineering, and we'll talk a little bit, and I'm going to use some examples from Edwards, um, have, you have lots of opportunities. And so the question is, why would you want to go into med tech? Um, what is about med tech? And hopefully this is a little bit inspiring about what the future holds, particularly for the structural hearts field. But I want to start with one thing, what this is. I want to talk to you about Ed. So Ed, Ed has a problem, okay? Ed has a medical problem, and I want to share with you a little bit about, I'm gonna give you a short video, and I want you to then try and think about what problem Ed has. And we'll run this and hopefully the sound will work. Two bars. Okay. One, two, one, two, three, four. My name is Ed Murray, and I play wind instruments. He plays the saxophone, he plays the flute, and the clarinet. I've been doing it for over 60 years, professionally. Music is very important in my dad's life. It's more than just a job. It's part of his identity. It brings him joy. The most important thing about being a wind instrument musician is breath, adequate breath, to develop a good sound. Without that, you don't play. So what problem does that have? Anyone? So he's short of breath, looks pretty good. And I'm sure you guys can guess from what Edwards does that he probably has a structural heart problem. Any guesses? Good guess, but wrong. He has a problem which just a few years ago was a problem that wouldn't be treated by anybody. He had a problem in a valve in his heart that frankly most surgeons wouldn't operate on because it was a sole problem. So he has tricuspid regurgitation isolated tricuspid regurgitation, which means that most people think he's not sick enough to actually get therapy. Why? Because the surgery itself would be probably too morbid and particularly have too high a mortality rate than his ability to play a saxophone and do what he does. The question is, how do we impact patients? At the end of the day, what our job is, is to find technology for patients to change their lives. And we kind of picked the holy grail as survival. And obviously, Billy did a great job of talking about how we change survival in these patients that cannot live without a heart. But there's a huge, vast number of patients that their quality of life, whether it's their heart failure, whether it's valvular disease, is so diminished, but they aren't necessarily near death. And so Ed kind of represents that problem. So really what I'm bringing him up is Ed ended up being a candidate for one of our early feasibility studies and received a experimental investigational tricuspid valve replacement. He was actually in the TRICED-1 study. You're now seeing him after that valve was placed. 
and he's now about a year and a half out. So the opportunity to actually do something and change a patient's life is what we do in med tech. So let me tell you a little bit about Edwards and the history. So Edwards Life Sciences, which you may or may not be familiar with, was really founded on the, the, this idea of patient-focused innovation. It was initially a physician and an engineer coming together, much like Billy talked about, which really becomes the center of what medical device innovation is all about. They came up with the first artificial valve. The starboard valve, right? That was Albert Starr, a cardiac surgeon at the University of Oregon, and Lowell Edwards, who was an engineer, who actually, ironically, wanted to develop the first artificial heart. Now, we kind of said, well, let's just start with a valve, and you can see how hard it is to obviously build an artificial heart. But that was really where Edwards Life Sciences actually started. And it started basically as Edward Labs. It went through a long history, was acquired actually by uh, American Health Systems and by Baxter and spun it in 2000s, uh, Edwards Life Sciences. But you can see these are the products that Edwards has made in the structural heart space over the course of the last 60 years. Many different implants, many different devices, many different implants for patients placed typically by surgeons initially, but now also by interventional cardiologists. And these are really the leaders that have done a lot of that work. Those are physicians who really partnered with engineers at Edwards Life Sciences to develop these technologies. So today our innovations are focused really on structural heart disease and the critically ill. And to give you a little bit of background on what Edwards Life Sciences is all about, it's really divided into five business units. So all, every company, you look at the ad side, Medtronic, great company, Boston Scientific, great company, Abbott, J&J, &J, and you look inside and they're all structured differently. There's no rhyme and reason to how they're structured. They're unique to that institution. So Edwards Life Sciences is broken up into five business units. So the transcatheter uh, valve replacement business, which is, was started as TAVR. The surgical heart business, the business is still growing. One of the few businesses out there that is still growing in surgical because we think there's an important place for cardiac surgery. A critical care business. And our most recent commercial business unit, the tri TMTT business, tri transcatheter <laughs> mitral and tricuspid therapies and a fifth business unit, which is a non-commercial business unit called Advanced Technologies, which I'm responsible for. What do we do there? We build the future. So everything about the future and what's coming next is going to be built within Advanced Technologies. TAVR was built within Advanced Technologies. TMTT was built within Advanced Technologies. So our next business unit will come out of Advanced Technologies. So I thought you'd give you a little idea of what Edwards is. So you're breaking it down a little bit over 15,000 employees globally. 50% of those patients are, are, are the employees are, are millennials or Gen Z. So yes, the, demo, the, the, you know, the demographics of companies are changing. So engineers, the lifeblood of a company like Edwards, over 2,000 engineers. And here's the take home for you. 17 to 18% of our gross sales is spent on R&D. So that's organic growth. So what do we do? We build stuff. We create stuff. We go after innovation. We don't buy a lot of stuff. We buy early technology, but we don't buy big companies. Why? Because we build everything internally. And that's a belief that Mike Masolem had, which is the reason that I decided to go to Edwards. I'm a guy who likes to build things. I'm a guy who likes to create things. And so I wasn't going to go to a company that was interested in kind of going and just buying commercial companies. I was interested in creating things. So 95% of our products are actually the market leader globally. So either we go big and we want to do something big and bold, or we don't do it at all. We have seven commercial big units all over the globe. We're in, I think, over 80 countries in, in the world. Um, and again, we have treated over 600,000 patients with catheter-based therapies now as we transition to less invasive therapies. Now, this isn't just to give you a perspective on, on uh, necessarily money, but just to give you one thing about kind of where the markets are going. This is Edwards Life Science Growth. So over the last 10 years, 1.9 billion to what's projected to be 5.4 billion this year, which means we're reaching a lot of patients, right? And ultimately it's because of its focus on opportunity and the patient demand. Structural heart disease is a massive problem. And in fact, till three years ago, there was no national campaign focused on structural heart disease focused on hypertension, focused on atrial fibrillation, focused on coronary disease, focused on stroke, but there was no national campaign focused on valvular heart disease. Luckily, there is now. 
and that's a partnership between the American Heart Association and Edwards Life Sciences. Because we think that this problem is so big, has such a big impact on patients out there, that it's worth taking a big swing for. So the idea of the triple win, the idea that uh, you improve outcomes, ultimately you enhance quality of life, like Ed is a great example, and that you have to no longer be just better, but you actually have to be cost effective. So you have to bring value to the system. And that's something that we didn't think about a lot when we were thinking about designing medical devices till just recently. Now it's not good enough to be better, right? You have to be better and you have to be more cost effective. Doesn't mean cheaper, means more cost effective as you think about the kind of innovation you're bringing to healthcare. And the key is to make long-term investments, which means that if you're a company that grows organically, you have to invest in what's gonna be over the next 10 years, not necessarily what's gonna be over the next three years in your operating plan. So here's kind of what our patient-focused innovation strategy is. So the idea of the three pillars, innovation, pioneering breakthrough technologies with compelling evidence, something that we're big believers in. So not only we want to invent it or create it, but we want to develop the trials and the studies that prove and demonstrate what it does for patients. Leadership, told you, leading groundbreaking standards care through trusted relationships. That's with physicians, that's with regulators, that's with payers, and ultimately the system as a whole. But the leadership means you want to go first. Going first is hard, right? Like Billy's talking about, being first out there of having a full artificial heart, being first is really hard. And frankly, it's never linear. It's one step forward, two steps back. But you also get the chance to pave, pave the way. You get a chance to actually disrupt the space. You get a chance to build the relationships with FDA, with the European regulators, with payers to change medicine for patients. And the ultimate thing is it's something a little bit different about Edwards is its focus. Edwards doesn't do anything else. We do structural heart critical care. We're not going to do anything else, which means that as a strategic objective, we think there's enough here to spend the next 20 to 30 years of the business. There's enough in structural heart that we need to, know, need to go into vascular. We don't need to go into neuro. We don't need to go in these other spaces because structural heart is so important. It's so meaningful for the population, and we've had such little effect ultimately on patients. So of those pillars, focus probably is one of the most important elements for it. It drives deeper understanding, which means that in the building, we have experts on tissue, on flow dynamics, on structural heart, on electrophysiology, because those people are so focused and such resident experts with their capability to have the ability to learn more. So just like here, you go to a great lab and you're working great center, it's an expert in what they do, you can actually generate other things during the same space as opposed to go somewhere else and think about something else. It also enables unmatched expertise and it gives you agility as well and allows disciplined prioritization of investments. You can make a decision about investments because you have great expertise in the, in the space. On the innovation side, we believe in dedicated teams. Dedicated teams are not that efficient necessarily, right? It's better to centralize things. So larger companies centralize some of their functions. We believe in actually having innovation teams that are direct, which means we put physicians and uh, mark marketeers and engineers together, and we'll talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes. You know, we attract passionate people that want to actually change medicine, and we put patient at the center of everything we do. And we're committed to demonstrate value, which means that you have to not just run the trials, which is the period and clinical evidence. Evidence means evidence on cost effectiveness as well. And that takes time. It doesn't mean the first trial you're talking about cost effective, but it means you have to be committed over a long period of time to demonstrate that evidence. And ultimately, we talked about leadership. It's trusted partnerships that change the practice of medicine. It's pioneering regulatory and payment pathways because ultimately, if you can't pay for it, it won't get to patient care. The best, most creative, incredible things, if there's no way to pay for it, the patient can't get it. And so ultimately, it's up to us to demonstrate that evidence. And we believe in investing early. Investing early means sometimes things take a really long time. And having been an entrepreneur before I came to a corporate, they take a lot longer than you ever think they will. Having been on the course of many things that look, took over a decade to bring that I thought would take a few years to get there. They always take much longer than you want. So let me give you a couple examples. This is Taver. Over a decade a year ago, we set out to establish new frontiers in heart valve therapy, right? The idea of putting an aortic valve actually through uh, the femoral vessel, right? And ultimately bringing it to the heart. But the problem was it was all huge. It was big, right? So 22, 24 French, these devices were, and in fact, half the devices that were delivered in the early trial was actually delivered transapically through the chest. 
50% of the studies actually in the first trials actually is how we did it. Where are we today? If you look at the Sapien 3 trial in 2019, actually only 7% are alternative access and we're now down to 14 French. So much smaller ability to access to get. What does that mean? A lot less bleeding, a lot more co less comorbidities, a lot uh, less complications for patients. Ultimately, this is what partner trial, the original trial looked like in 20, 2011. All cause death, 3.4%. People said, pretty good, right? This is a really sick population. All stroke, a major issue when we first started, 5.5%. Major vascular complications, 11%. And the index hospitalization in a, in a catheter base was eight days. Remember, we're going through the chest in half these patients. Partner trial 2019, the most largest randomized trial that of recent, and there's several other that are ongoing, but the quickest report, 1% all-cause uh, death, 1.2% all-cause stroke, vascular complications 2%, average hospitalization globally 3%, a little bit less than that in the United States. But here's the kicker. On the left, that was 30-day data. This is one-year data now, okay? So think about that. The ability at one year, 99% of the patients are alive. And this is in a patient population that's in their 70s on average, right? What's the normal mortality rate for that population? So that's changing medicine. So ultimately, we've made significant progress over the time. And what I'm trying to demonstrate to you is this all happened because of engineering, right? Evidence in clinical trials, but this is the ability to see the vision and to take the vision and develop the evidence. But it all happened. So 30-day 30 cause, 30 cause, all-cause mortality went down dramatically. 30-day disability stroke, which was a major problem initially, has come down dramatically. And we call moderate to severe perivalvular leak. That's leaking around the valve has significantly improved. And now, actually, the most recent iteration, the uh, Sapien S3 Ultra, we're down to a half a percent of people that have greater than mild PBL. So ultimately, we are at a mean procedure time of 45 minutes for doing this procedure. Patients go home. 80% of the time they go home the next day and 96% of patients are discharged home as opposed to getting out of the hospital and going to a nursing facility. That's changing medicine. So TAVR's transformed patient care for severe aortic stenosis, but if you look at the pre-TAVR era, right, the average survival was 6.8 years before TAVR, okay? That's with patients who actually got aortic valve uh, replacement. Now it's 11.5 years. So this was actually just published in the American Journal of Cardiology now proving cost effectiveness of TAVR. Improved life, quality of life, quality. So now, again, it's about the value you create, not just about the innovations that you create. So let's talk about, you know, back to kind of our tricuspid and mitral area. So this is probably the problem that is bigger than aortic stenosis by far. So if you look at the overall number of patients, greater than 4 million patients in the U.S., right, have this problem, and yet less than 2% of them are treated a significant impact on quality of life, whether it's tricuspid disease or mitral valve disease. And we're looking at a business now that looks like it could be upwards of a billion dollars that will grow over the course between now and 2028 to greater than five billion. This is where the massive amount of structural heart growth is gonna be. So a little bit about that. How many people have heard about TIER? Trying to cast their edge to edge repair. Yes, Billy, I know you know what it is. So, tear is basically the Billy. Alferi stitch was the first initially. You stitch the two leaflets together, right? And this was the idea of a device. Originally, Evalve was the first company to do, came out of the foundry in Menlo Park, California, just right next to Stanford, was this idea of actually putting a clip actually in between the leaflets and ultimately a device. Well, that entire field has grown out. There's been lots of iterations of it, but tear therapy. Pascal, which is the next device that's going to come into the tier space after MitraClip, provides a more versatile implant, an atraumatic clasp control, and ultimately compliant implant. The idea being an improvement that solves some of the problems that are out there in tier therapy. And ultimately, its adoption is, has to be built on evidence, right? So there's been about 4,500 patients that have been treated by Pascal. About 3,800 of them have been reported in, in the data, and about 450 patients that study follow-up. But you can see the trials here. You can't just do the work, you have to actually develop the evidence. And ultimately, we have two large investigational studies, pivotal trials, class 2D, which will read out at the end of this year, and actually class 2F, which will hopefully read out the following year for both a degenerative and functional mitral regurgitation. And then, of course, there's also the history of what's going on in tricuspid disease. 
And in fact, this is tricuspid tear therapy, tricuspid clipping, versus now tricuspid replacement. The TRISEN2 trial is an ongoing pivotal trial that is actually studying the uh, evoke valve and placement uh, to see investigationally if it will provide the same benefit for patients. This is the type of therapy that uh, Ed got. So he was a patient actually in the TRISEN1 trial, the first early feasibility that's now gone on to a pivotal trial. So the question is, of this portfolio, you've got two different approaches. You've got tear therapy, right? which is actually clipping the leaflets together procedurally and placing a small clip or replacing the entire valve with something like Evoke, which they're different. We'll have to see ultimately which therapy bears itself best out for which patient. And that'll be a long journey of trying to figure that out. And it'll be more and more engineering to actually create those improvements. So what about the surgical? What about the people doing surgery? We talked about transcatheter therapy. Okay. The idea is that surgery is still critically important. Okay? A company that thinks that transforming medicine with catheter-based less invasive still thinks surgery is really important. What defines surgery? I'm not quite sure. Is it a small hole with a catheter or was it a blade? The, those worlds are merging together. But ultimately, the question is what's best for the patient. So you need to understand what we need to solve. What are the unsolved medical problems that are out there? Are they best solved with a surgical impact? Are they best solved with a catheter-based therapy? And ultimately, what we'd like to see is this. It's growth because of this approach, more awareness. The, the, the market is very, very large for structural heart disease. We need more diagnosis. We need more patients being screened. We need more imaging to evaluate those patients. And we need more people being referred to what we call the heart team. Heart team is interventionalists and structuralists that are all working together, surgeons, to try and find what the best therapy for that patient is. And taking into consideration patient preference. Something that's becoming more and more important is what does the patient want, not just what physicians think is best for them. But ultimately, the idea of being referred to the heart team and ultimately making decisions that it will be best for some patients to get surgical therapy. And if it is, the question will be, who are those patients? Who is best treated surgically? Typically, it will be younger patients, more active patients, patients with anatomical complexity that aren't best met by catheter-based therapies, and ultimately, Patients with heterogeneous disease requiring combined therapies like needing to replace the aortic root, not just the aortic valve. And some other complex disease like coronary disease bypass grafting and valvular disease at the same time. So one of the big challenges is going to be this idea over pioneering more resilient surgical therapies. The durability question, Billy and I talked about this earlier, is going to be how long does it last? As the population grows, it's great to bring innovations there. Great therapies are less invasive, but if they don't last as long, are they ultimately the best for the patient? So durability is going to be a really, really important thing. Now, the history of Edwards Life Sciences has been basically this long history of going from the first mechanical valve, the por first porcine valve, the first bovine valve, and the first transcatheter valve. So this is the next generation, which is what we call resilient, which is a capping technology for capping aldehydes, a chemical process for bovine tissue that allows you to ultimately cap out the aldehydes so they don't calcify. Because calcification is ultimately causing generation of heart valves. The initial calcification, but also the calcification, if you don't change the metabolic environment, why would you think that the implant valve isn't going to deteriorate the same rate or faster? So this idea of resili is chemical processing where we actually cap, which stops calcification and formation pathways. And ultimately, you have to prove it out. So here's the plan for the long-term evidence. In 2004, again, making long-term investments, we started basically this journey of resilient tissue development. In 2011, we read out the first resilient feasibility trial, which was initiated. And ultimately, in 2012, the commenced trial. And now we have ongoing numbers of 4,800 patients that are being followed that have resilient tissue and actually have five-year data. So five years of outcomes shows that 0% structural valve deterioration in the first five years. That is far beyond what we've ever been able to see in structural heart. So typically we expect that there are patients that deteriorate faster than others. There is a lot of heterogeneity in the biology. And as a result, our ability to get past that to be able to have durable tissue is going to be probably the big, next biggest challenge out there in structural heart. Because you can make it smaller, you can make it faster, you make it iteration, but you've got to make it more durable and long term to be taking care of younger patients. So ultimately, this kind of shows the history, this idea of mechanical valves to porcine valves to bovine valves to now resilia. 
and the platforms in both aortic and mitral valve disease. And there's just some of the, the surgical products that now, and we just got approval and just launched the Mitris, which is basically the mitral valve implant, which has resilient tissue following Inspris and Connect, which are both aortic valve technologies. So let's talk a little bit about the innovation process. I am a big believer from the time I spent 20 years at Stanford and ran the biodesign uh, fellowship program of this belief that we need to bring engineers, marketeers, and clinicians together. That is the way you innovate. You cannot innovate in a vacuum, and five of the smartest engineers will not solve the problem, nor will five business people or five doctors. You've got to bring uh, a diverse, heterogeneous group together, and by the way, not just by training, but by gender, by cultural background, both and socioeconomic background, because it needs to reflect the patients we take care of. We also created this idea that we needed to actually bring more clinical acumen into Edwards. So when I got to Edwards, one of my big goals was to bring more physicians, more clinical thinkers into Edwards. So we started this program, which we have teamed up with a group called the Cardiovascular Research Foundation, which we bring young cardiac surgeons and interventionalists into Edwards to spend a year with us, and they sit side by side with our engineers and business people coming up and inventing. So the idea that you run to the doctor and ask them if they like your idea, and then you run back and work on it for the next several weeks to months, and then you run back to the doctor and ask them, we want to speed up that iteration. We want it to happen every day at the table. So we want to bring clinicians into the business who actually work at Edwards or spend some time or part of their career at Edwards. The idea that ultimately what we want is we want to bring this team together, then bring formal R&D, and we've restructured at Edwards. We've also tried to create what we have what we call centers of excellence now. So we have center of excellence in polymers and textiles, center of excellence in metals, advanced tissues, um, and we actually have capability, a, a tissue center of excellence, which is who came up with Resilia. The idea being that testing and this capability of bringing people together to solve problems that ultimately change structural heart disease is kind of what the mantra at Edwards is all about. So ultimately, you've got to develop the evidence, you have to develop the clinical trials, and ultimately, you have to get them regulatory approved, and you ultimately got to get the results, because ultimately, everything comes back to Ed, right? Ed is, and you saw the video of him after playing the saxophone, he couldn't hold his breath for actually more than 13 seconds. Just couldn't do it because he had such bad tricuspid regurgitation. Now he's a changed person, and luckily, he seems like, for him, in this case, for him as an individual, it appears that he's doing better, at least at this point. You have to develop the evidence, you have to develop the ability to get paid, and you have to have adoption. You have to encourage people to get out there and to get screened to ultimately provide that benefit. So I think that ultimately Edwards, because of the focus on engineering, because of the focus on innovation, but ultimately that focus of innovation on the patient, we're kind of set for growth, right? Ultimately, and what does that mean? It means hopefully more patients will get treated. Why? We take on large populations. There is a huge number of patients that we are unrecognizing or not taking care of of structural heart disease. Ultimately, we want to form partnerships with everybody. We want to form partnerships with academic centers. We want to form relationships with the FDA, with payers. Ultimately, credible and trusting relationships. And you do that by leading. You do that by going first. You do that by building long-term relationships that are durable over a long period of time. A patient-focused culture is critical, which means that everyone at Edwards understands that priority one is the patient. I think we just did a, a survey, and over 90-some percent of the folks said that the most important decision they make every day, the main decisions they make, are not about the business's bottom line. It's about the patient. And ultimately, innovative R&D, creative ideas, great thinkers that think outside the box, that bring great ideas to a well-defined clinical problem, and ultimately have sustainable results. So I guess wanted to give you a little bit of a, a perspective on what Edwards Life Sciences is. There's lots of companies out there. There's lots of people doing very impactful things. Edwards is doing this, narrow, very focused on one significant big problem, structural heart disease, just to give you a little bit of an example. All right, thank you. I think you match Billy's energy. So uh, I think the... <laughs> person that has to follow you, both of you, is really at a, a big task ahead of them. Um, any questions from the audience? And I'll ask the same one I asked Billy though. Yeah. Um, young innovators, what do you recommend they put in their toolbox? And what are you looking for to hire at Edwards? Yeah, so um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll stretch the answer a little bit out. So I spent 15, minutes, 15 years running the, the uh, fellowship program at Stanford, physicians, engineers, um, marketeers, and I counsel all of them about their careers. And every single one of them came to Stanford, as you can imagine, and said, I want to be an entrepreneur. And the thing is, I want to start a company. I said, fantastic, great. What's the next move? I want to go start a company. I said, the best place you can go in your career early, in my opinion, something I didn't do, is a place that's going to give you mentorship, right? Mentorship is the most important element. And the hardest thing when you're, you know, been in school for years is the first thing you think about is, I want to go to work, right? And the reality is that work, you're going to be learning the rest of your life. And I would tell you that I think Billy would agree with me, what's made the biggest difference in our careers are mentors. We had incredible mentors. I had incredible mentors from Tony DeMaria to Paul Yock to uh, Bob Harrington, incredible folks along the way who really helped shape the direction I took. So the answer is you need to go someplace that you can be mentored early. The better the mentors are, you're going to have more and more opportunities out there. And if that happens to be an early stage company that has great leadership and a great mentor, so be it. The nice thing about most large cap companies, they have more resources and they will develop you early in your career. There's always the opportunity to then take that experience, be entrepreneurial, be innovative where you're working. It's not a place you're thinking, it's a, it's a philosophy. And then take the opportunity to take your idea and go do it. So what we're looking for, creative, innovative, and I would tell you that the most important thing, and you probably got this from hopefully Billy and I both is, I love hunger. I love people that are, I will take, I will take a degree from middle of nowhere over a degree at, from Harvard or anywhere else for someone who's got the hunger to make an impact in what they do. Everybody's smart at this level. It comes down to hunger. And so you have to have the drive to be able to do it. So if you're hungry, come get my card, all right? Because we're looking. So as you saw, 2,000 engineers, we want to grow. And we intend to, over the horizon, we'll grow probably by another 9,000 employees over the next seven years. It means a lot of engineers. So in order to do that, we need great people. That's good. Other questions? Will? Yeah, thanks, Todd. That was great. Uh, some of the projects in your space, they take a long time. So that calcification resistant tissue will be for, I don't know, 20 plus years. Yeah. Uh, the, the average time that people stay in jobs these days is pretty short. I don't know, four years or something. Yeah. How, how do you keep the excitement and enthusiasm going over these necessarily long-term projects that are uh, prevalent in um, the health sciences technology no, it's a, it's a great, as we said, and that's why I'm part of the point. So half, half the employees at Edwards are millennials or Gen Zs, right? There's a different belief and it's a different, it's not right or wrong, it's just different in how people take on challenges, what they want in their career, their focus. And so how do you keep that? I believe it's culture. As they say, culture eats you know, strategy for, for breakfast. Ultimately, the culture of a company, what its values are and what it does and whether people want to belong to it, is what keeps them hopefully placed. And luckily, so far, we've had a really high retention rate but the challenges are out there because as everyone gets out there, there's great opportunities. And so you want to keep people at a belief and the culture is that ultimately it's the goal. And I know this seems quirky, you know, it's like, oh, it's easy to say, you know, visit the campus. It is about the patient at Edwards. It is about the impact. We want people to actually be, we want people to get to the hospital. We want all our technicians, our engineers, clinicians, everyone spends time seeing what they do so they understand what they do every day. Hopefully that inspires them enough to keep, you know, for the long haul, because it is the challenge. Well, I mean, it's a huge challenge, right? How do you keep focused over a long period of time when there's all this dynamics going in the environment, especially the great resignation, right? People are moving on and that knowledge is leaving the company. How do you retain it, especially when you're on the long-term trajectory? It's a challenge, but hopefully it is culture that ultimately trumps it all. Yeah. Hi, excuse me. Um, I'm a clinician. We have a lot of patients with an admit need uh, often with a mitral valve disease mixed with regurgitation and stenosis, with uh, prohibitive uh, surgical risk score often uh, after radiotherapy, no? And uh, with no enough uh, calcification to anchor like a sapien valve. Um, I wanted to know if uh, you have the idea of use uh, evoke valve or you have another mitral uh, transcatheter valve. Uh, to treat this number of patients that are not enough, uh, like uh, aortic stenosis, but uh, often uh, cannot be uh, surgical candidates. Uh, so, 
uh, if there is a, uh, you have a, mm, you if you wanted to uh, use the evoc valve also in mitral valve disease or uh, you mm, aim to do another valve for uh, this type of patients so, good. so I, th I think I understand the question is what what's the approach basically in, in Mac heavily calcified mitral is that No, no, in Mac, but no, uh, yeah, in Mac, you, you now we use Sapien, no? Trascadeter right. aortic valve. Uh, but if they have no enough to, um, to anchor the Sapien, yeah. uh, if you project, another, if you yeah. want to, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so we, ha we have two internal programs. So yes, we're very interested and very motivated by mitral. So tier is really kind of the first thing, so repair. We also have annular reduction, so we have, you know, cinching basically the valve percutaneously, and then mitral valve replacement, we have two ongoing programs. One of them, obviously, is placing sapien valve in, in, in MAC, but we actually have the MDOC system, which is a docking system for the sapien valve, and that's actually in a pivotal trial now. So that's actually in a ongoing large trial, and we'll see what the results looks like that. And the question will be, is there another transcatheter approach that you place? And stay tuned, that's all I can say. Todd, um, you have different experiences. Can you tell us about innovation in big companies, in small companies, focused companies? Big companies have been a problem in, in getting innovation really through. Yeah. Uh, what, what's, your, what's your view? Uh, uh, how do you? Yeah, no, it's a, um, it's a, great, it's a great topic. So I, I was an entrepreneur my entire career, right? Clinician, I was an engineer. So, was an engineer, came out, worked five years as an engineer, went back to medical school, went through training, became an intervention cardiologist, and started multiple companies, and was a CMO, was an entrepreneur out in the field until I became, a, so I've only been in a corporate for three years. Um, having been at Stanford and, and worked and spent time with lots of companies, uh, during my tenure, 37 companies we spun out of Stanford, um, the question was, why would you want to go to a big company? Right? Big companies don't innovate, right? They're slow, they buy small companies. Um, I think the question is, um, what's the strategy, and can, can a big company innovate under the right circumstances? And so my hope is that um, the challenge to me and the challenge for most of my colleagues was, can you actually prove that you can go to Edwards and continue to innovate? Um, I think that what we try to do is build an environment similar to what we had. So um, I mentioned we have a fifth business unit, a non-commercial business unit. So that was one of the biggest things for me was, I do not want to be tied down to a commercial you know, timelines, because everything happens, you get reached the end of the quarter, everything, every resource gets pulled, basically, to solve the crisis, understandably. So you have to be completely isolated. You have to, you have, to have a separate P&L, separate responsibilities, separate facilities, people keep people away, and the ability to put people together uh, and work conductively, and there are some challenges with that, to be honest. Um, I think that have been great partners, but the, the HR structure in a big company is not designed necessarily for flat innovation. Um, there's a hierarchy that says that you report to this person and this has to have this structure and this has this structure. And I said, I wanted to bring in what I did at Stanford. I wanted engineers, clinicians, and marketeers to function at the same level. And I said, couldn't be done. Luckily, with a lot of support, frankly, from Mike, we did change it. We changed it with the business unit. They all sit at the same level. In order to do that, then there isn't this hierarchy of your idea is better than my idea because you're a senior director and I'm a director, right? So you come together with the idea that we want to solve problems. And you have to come to the point where there is a structure for respectful disagreement and you're rewarded ultimately for killing things as opposed to rewarded for keeping a project going. So ultimately the idea is what, what is the currency of innovation in a company? The currency is to ultimately find something that works as opposed to trying to find something that ultimately you think. So running a more of a process approach as opposed to a project approach. So Everyone wants their project to be successful, right? Everyone loves their innovation. So you continue to force the big rock up the hill. And sometimes that's exactly the right move. But a lot of times it's not. So you have to have lots of projects running side by side and objectively making them compete on metrics, which means that you have to have enough resource to be able to do so. So if you only have one project, I think you're probably really, really smart and a lot smarter than I am. I always took multiple projects and let them compete with each other and then chose the one that I thought was the most fruitful. So that's the approach that I've taken. It's the only approach I know how to take. And that's what we've tried to do. It's not easy though, because people, you think about the challenges as an example that engineers come into, 
what are the rewards of being an engineer? So if you're working on Sapien 4, the next valve out there, what are the challenges for you? They're big, big technical challenges, big challenges in creation scientifically. You have no clinical risk, you have no market risk, you have no scientific risk, you have no reimbursement risk, you have no, you know, those risks have all been the risk. Now take a white piece of paper and say create something, every risk is there. So people associate often project failure with career failure. And you have to disconnect those things, which is sometimes the most important thing is to reward you for saying this will not work and let's take the resources and put them over here. So how do you incentivize innovation? So we're trying a lot of different things in advanced tech to incentivize our engineers on how to take the right path and how to say, we've explored it and we should go here, not here, and reward them for that as opposed to reward them for just what they think is success because they'll just pick the project they think is the easiest to get there. We'll see if it works. All right, thank you. All right, thank you.